Welcome to the Group Dentistry Now Show, the voice of the DSO industry. Kim Larson and Bill Newman talk to industry leaders about their challenges, successes, and the future of group dentistry. Visit groupdentistrynow.com for more DSO analysis, news, and events. Looking for a job or have a job to fill? Visit joindso.com. We hope you enjoy today's show. Welcome back to the Group Dentistry Now show. I'm Bill Newman. Uh, we are, I think, up to episode 108, so quite a few under our belt. And um, just always thankful to the audience. So whether you're listening in on Apple or Spotify or uh, Google, uh, or you happen to be watching us on YouTube, thanks for being a part of the, uh, the community. And uh, with the great audience like you, we always get great guests. So we have two wonderful guests here. Uh, we have Mark Ilagan from Air Techniques. Mark, welcome to the Group Dentistry Now Show. Thanks for having me. And we have Dr. Rob Brandis. Rob, welcome to the show. Thank you. And I was commenting before we started the record and actually before Mark jumped on about uh, Rob's really cool shelving in the back. So Rob, with that, maybe you can give us a little bit of a background on where you are right now and um, you know, we're, t talk a little bit about your practice. Sure, um, I'm, I currently live in uh, New Mexico between Santa Fe and Albuquerque, New Mexico in a little town called Placitas. I work in a group practice that has an office in Albuquerque in the city. And I work uh, part-time at a rural office uh, on the other side of the mountain from Albuquerque uh, too. I, I have experience in private practice and group practice and I also have uh, 20 years plus uh, experience in the the DSO um, format, and uh, I am I am a periodontist by by training. And you're also the founder of Hands On Implant Institute and the co-founder of the National Sleep Alliance. Can you talk about those organizations briefly? Sure, I've uh, I've been involved in educating uh, general dentists for quite a long time, uh, 15 plus years, uh, uh, including comb beam education, implant dentistry and, and airway. That's great. Thanks, Dr. Brandis. Uh, Mark, i uh, love to get a little bit of your background. I know you're on the West Coast. Uh, you're with uh, Air Techniques and you are the imaging sales manager for the West. That's correct. I, I jumped on with Air Techniques probably seven months ago and I've been loving it ever since. A great company, great products, great support. Uh, I really love the software on the CVCT side. There's, there's a lot to offer here and a lot of growth. Uh, my background did start in the Pacific Northwest in Portland, Oregon, uh, with, a, with a dealer named Burkhart Dental. And fairly quickly, um, Serona approached me and hired me. And I was with Serona for about uh, 13 years. And between Serona and Air Techniques, I was able to co-found uh, CCAT USA with a group of guys, and I've been loving that. Um, still good friends with everybody I've been working with, so uh, it's nice to have a big network, and, and there's great people in this industry, so I don't, I don't see myself going anywhere except stay in dentistry, and as you guys know, once you're in dentistry, everybody says you're, you stay, so That's I've been nice. enjoying it. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was told when I got in for sure. So and 20 years later, you know, I, I am. So 
it's uh, it is a, it is a great industry. And Mark, I actually was when I was doing a little bit of uh, homework for this podcast. Uh, you have a YouTube channel. I do. I call it Coffee and Cone Beam, and it is just a casual conversation with doctors such as Dr. Brandis, Dr. Heidi Kohlfarber, Jay Resnick, and other doctors. Um, just to go over CBCT cases, I understand this. Every doctor looks at a case differently. They, they may treat the same, but their thought processes may be different. So getting to hear what people are thinking about when they're looking at a case, it's really interesting to me. And the result and the goal is always better patient care, of course. And I just like and curious about understanding how doctors get to that treatment plan. And there's so many ways to do it and so many schools of thought. So there is so much to learn. So we're going to call this episode the impact zone. Uh, discover the impact cone beam technology can have on clinical diagnosis, treatment planning, and case acceptance for your group practice. So that's why we have Mark and Rob with us today to kind of go through that uh, discovery process. Um, this is going to be fun. Uh, so uh, we talked a little bit about, so Dr. Brandis, you're at a group practice and you also are working at another practice that's more rural in nature, right? Right, right. <clears throat> okay. Exactly. So both, both settings, yes. So let, let, let's talk a little bit about why uh, and when you decided to purchase your CBCT machine, Dr. Brandis. So kind of when when did that happen and what was the why behind that? Uh, that happened about 12 years ago for me, and uh, I uh, have a fairly large implant component to my practice, and uh, so I really purchased that round implant surgery and, and the possibility of doing guided implant surgery. Okay. And um, I mean, is that was that really the, the reason was because of the, the, the implant focus you had at your practice? <clears throat> That's we kind of looked at to be two uh, D versus going to CBCT. Yeah, that was the main emphasis at the time, and I I uh, I had a few concerns uh, when when I was uh, doing it. One was was it really necessary for me to have this in order to to stay current and and up to date? And then and then could I really make it work from a return on investment standpoint? And uh, and so that, that's kind of where I was at. And uh, it certainly wasn't brand new technology. Uh, so it wasn't a bleeding edge type thing, but it was, you know, it's really kind of cutting edge at the same time. And uh, so I didn't want to get behind the curve. And, and I, uh, I had reservations when I, when I first, uh, you know, got into CVCT. That, that was almost immediately alleviated once I, I got the equipment in my office. Uh, those concerns dissipated rapidly. So that was that was uh, a dozen years ago, uh, right? Mar Mark, what's what's the percentage of of docs out there that are using two um, D um, versus uh, CBCT? And I mean, I guess the other question should be is you know maybe some some people don't necessarily need CBCT. So how do you kind of determine <clears throat> that? That's a great question. Um, I don't know the exact percentage. It would surprise me if it's even at 10%. I would like to say it's 10% uh, that own CBCT. But uh, after leaving a larger uh, known imaging company, I realized outside of that world, there's a lot of people that don't have CBCT that are relying on 2D. What I've seen, though, is more and more people are interested in CBCT. Maybe it's because their oral surgeon is using it or their endodontist or their friends have CBCT for a num number of reasons. And they're used to using CB, uh, I'm sorry, 2D panoramic images on a regular basis. But what I find is doctors that buy CBCT will start using it primarily for the 2D site because they're comfortable with it. And then use it every once in a while for 3D. And then slowly they start seeing the diagnostic benefit of CBCT for the cost of the radiation being exposed, um, that they start making a shift slowly from 2D to 3D for diagnostic purposes and implant purposes, 
to more 3D CBCT and 2D starting to go as a backup or or as a follow-up source of imaging. So Mark, that's a really great point. And um, you know, I don't want to hijack one of the podcasts that you've done before, but when you reference radiation, um, Dr. Brandis, I know you talked a little bit about this in, in uh, the podcast that you were on with Mark. Tell me about the difference, um, you know, 2D compared to CBCT. Well, the difference between 2D information and, and CBCT uh, is, is really once you can, once you see three dimensional images uh, and you can scan through volumes and look at anything from a buccal lingual perspective or a, a closal apical perspective or a cross sectional view, then you see things when, as you scan through a volume, literally hundreds of images compared to one image in one plane. So it really is a, a three dimensional look at, at information. What I didn't understand in when I first purchased CBCT that I became well aware of is that the real richness in this technology, I think, is in diagnosis and treatment planning. It's not an implantology. Uh, the, the industry went for implantology right off the bat. It was sort of the low lying fruit. Uh, it was easy to find people that were doing a lot of implants and, and try and pluck those people into comb beam right off. After using it, though, it became apparent to me that the real richness is in, in, in diagnosis and treatment planning, and lots of studies support that. There's, there's studies that show that between a 28 and 34% increase in diagnosis from comb beam compared to a uh, regular conventional 2D image. And so uh, that that's a, was one big component. The other one is once I found that I showed these images to patients, live right in front of them, that uh, they engage these images unlike they did with 2D images. And it became a very interactive experience and they're fascinated with the, the technology. So it became a really excellent uh, treatment planning case presentation source. And so now for me, um, it really is kind of the central core of an initial exam and uh, and patient engagement and treatment plan at the same time. And, and uh, I think it's like anything, you have to learn how to integrate that into your workflow in order to have it happen uh, in a seamless way. And you have to be good at navigating, but the learning curve for this is pretty quick. And so once you can see in 3D, so to speak, uh, it's very hard to imagine looking at things in 2D. Mark, are you seeing this with, with a lot of your customers as well that it's not you maybe they initially were looking at it from an implant standpoint and are now using it for treatment planning absolutely right the incidental finding increase that dr brandis mentioned is real and if you think about it this way bill think about all the cases in your practice that have a watch on it and there's a watch on it because you really don't know what's going on so with CBCT giving you more information, a lot of those watches become treatment plans just because of the additional information you could see in CBCT. When Dr. Brandis was talking about radiation dose uh, versus 2D versus uh, 2D versus 3D, according to Dr. John Ludlow, he shares this information for a full mouth series digital size two sensors. So 18 images size two digital equates to 171 microsieverts according to one of his studies. So 171 microsieverts for a full mouth series, and you know those primarily crowns, not a lot of subgingival information there, versus a cone beam image, which allows more information to be seen in the full jaw, full, full uh, oral maxillofacial region. And that averages about 69 microsieverts for a standard scan. So a full mouth series, size two, digital sensors at 171 microsieverts versus 69 microsieverts for a standard scan. Wow. So what, when, so we, if you have, if you're using 2D and now we're going to CBCT, can you talk a little bit about when you would use one versus the other, or are you just, you know, is, is it totally CBCT now or does it does it really depend on what you're looking for or, or, or what you're doing? Uh, the, the answer there um, is 
there's very few circumstances that uh, I use 2D for. Uh, it primarily involves follow-up. Like if you've done a bone graft and you want to see how that's healing, you can isolate the software to just take an image of just that area just to see whether it's filling it properly. But when it comes to regular everyday stuff, uh, it's primarily 3D. It's, it's, it, 3D has really taken that over. It's not only the increase in diagnosis and, and presentation, but the, the thing that really becomes readily apparent that Mark was sort of alluding to is there, there's a lot better decision making. You might be able to find pathology on any kind of image, a, a conventional 2D pan, a, a PA. But when you can look at it 3D, then the decision making as far as what the treatment should be for that, that tooth can be dramatically different. You, you, um, 2D tends to underestimate bone loss and overestimate bone gain and bone grafting. Uh, whereas 3D gives you a real image. It's everything is a one-to-one -one ratio. So um, we, you would look at an image, for example, and see it, see some type of lesion. But when you look at it in 3D, you might realize that it's not amenable to being retreated. So we're seeing a lot of practitioners now uh, send out endodontically treated teeth to, to uh, endodontists out of their practice for retreat. Uh, most endo uh, offices have 3D these days, and once they image it in 3D, recognize that it's not really a good candidate for retreatment because of the bone loss and the problems with the tooth, and recommend extraction. So um, that's an unfortunate situation for the, the general office because now they've referred the patient out, patient got charged for a consult and an image, and then got sent back ultimately just to have the tooth extracted. So there's a lot better decision making involved. You can't weigh that into an amount necessarily, but uh, also a lot easier to explain to the patients about what's happening. So there's a lot of co-discovery with those images in 3D too. So the answer, the, the, the quick answer to your question then, I guess I gave that up a little while ago, but the, the answer really is 2D is only for very isolated circumstances uh, that the additional exposure for the 3D image is, is, is minimal, like Mark mentioned. And so that's really what we end up uh, doing all the time. Can I add to that, Dr. Brandis? Because I know I know we're both uh, believers in the Laura principle, right? Um, so when it comes to children, I'm very we're very cautious when uh, we're talking about exposure to children. So those things have to come into play, and be careful with that. Of course, you're not going to cone beam all kids just because a cone beam, right? Um, so we have to be careful with that. Um, however, this is what I've seen, Bill. This is interesting. I see doctors who get cone beam first will do a 2D pano, and which is great. Sometimes it has the answer for that they're looking for, the information that they're looking for. But often I see them not only taking the 2D pano, but they will take an additional cone beam on top of that because they want to see more, they'll see, oh, I wish I could see that a little better. So they take an additional image. What, what would be better in some cases, not all cases, would it be better taking a 3D from the get-go and still getting a decent pan out of it? Or taking a 2D, then taking a CBCT? Right. Along, along those lines too, I'd like to say, yeah, of course kids were always got to be sensitive to to uh, exposing kids and, and the necessity of that. I do think though that um, we've always had no problem justifying an FMX on a new patient exam, for example. Uh, that, that's been, been the standard since we've been in school, whether that was a film FMX or a digital FMX. And uh, today we have the ability to utilize this technology to get a lot more information as a baseline, even with somebody that doesn't have any pathology and we'll have a baseline image, a 3D image to be able to compare back to. So um, I, I think that part of the success of making this work in, in practice is not only feeling comfortable with, with you know, the utilization of the, of the technology, but also figuring out how to correctly implement this into the office so it becomes an everyday thing, not just an isolated case for a, a third molar extractions or an implant case, because the richness, again, is in the diagnostic information. 
So, Mark, you, you alluded to the fact <clears throat> you didn't know the exact percentage, but it's something like 10 percent or maybe a little bit higher as far as uh, clinicians that are using CBCT currently. Um, so if we look at that, you know, what's and, and Dr. Brandis, it'd be great to get your feedback, too. When you made the change, you know, was it intimidating at first? Like, why? Why are we only at 10 percent? And it seems and it's been out for probably more than that, more than a dozen years, 15 years, 20 years, maybe. Um, so what, why, why is the uptake been so um, slow? Uh, my idea about that, not being a salesperson, uh, my, my idea about that is real simple. And that, I sort of alluded to it. And I think that the, the industry went after the low hanging fruit and that was implantology. And, you know, if I had to sit back and I'm, let's say that I'm a uh, just a restorative dentist, or I'm just only doing restorative dentistry, it, it would be very hard to justify cone beam from, from that standpoint. It also would be pretty tough if I only did a couple implants a month, for example, to say, well, if I really need that, I can always send that out to an outside imaging center. I think largely just because the, the industry didn't know what they have, I still don't think a lot of them understand what they have from a diagnostic treatment plan standpoint. So a lot of the educational things that I do, that's where I really tend to focus is on what I call 3D every day, because I think that this equipment can be easily, easily utilized in a, in a correct uh, ethical clinical manner on, uh, on lots of patients every day. And, uh, and, it, and the benefit uh, is definitely improved care you know, for the patient. Mark, any feedback on that? Yes, um, I believe doctors are scared of technology. Um, some of them are not comfortable with it. Let's say they have been practicing for a number of years without it. Do they see the benefits of bringing in something that is high tech like this if they're not computer savvy, right? So we know some computers scare some people. So what we have seen recently is the advent of um, AI and those applications working into the CBCT world. So it's more usable, user-friendly, so it's less intimidating. Um, and I, I think not only the um, intimidation of technology, it may be the cost too. So cone beam used to be much higher. Uh, when it first came out, when Dr. Brandis bought his first cone beam, I, I roughly know how much. Didn't I sell that to you? I'm not sure. If I, did. I think you did. <laughs> but and I, I don't, and I and I have no buyer's remorse. So we're still <laughs> uh, the the cost was significantly higher. Today, it's not as intimidating as far as the price. It is roughly the price of a high end 2D machine back then, right? Um, that's, that's roughly where the cost is today for a cone beam, entry-level cone beam, and it's easier to use and the resources are there. So there has been an increase. I have seen an increase in CBCT sales, uh, because it is becoming part of the norm in dentistry, but it's taken 13, 15 years. Yeah. And I think it's to grow. And I and I I think uh, I think it's really back to uh, what I said initially, Bill. And I think that that I think that the the capability of the technology was way was way undersold. And uh, once I had the technology, uh, that's why my concerns about the return on my investment and so forth just just vaporized because I could use the technology all the time. Um, in, in lots of different applications and extractions and evaluating endodontic lesions, all kinds of other things. And then I also had a good baseline. So it's like any investment in anything in our practice, uh, you know, you've got to use it in order to make it uh, worthwhile. And, and there's, there's some people that really haven't learned that in the process of their, of their training and still only use it occasionally just in implant cases. And that, that's uh, that's like having a really uh, nice sports car, not, never getting out of first gear, and and you can decide, you know, you know how fast you want to go and what 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 areas of dentistry you want to focus on, but you you have that capability right there with you, 
and there's no reason not to, to, to utilize it. I also will say that once you have this technology and master it, and it does have a fairly quick learning curve, um, it really uh, makes uh, clinical practice a lot more interesting and uh, a lot more dynamic. Patients appreciate it and engage these Im images. Uh, patients like technology, even though us dentists might be in intimidated by the next ripple. Um, and I think there's always the doubt about, well, it works for other people, but is it going to work for me? And that, and I, but I, patients uh, like technology, as you see in phones and cars and other things. And so they readily engage this technology, at least as a consumer. And so you want a format that you can display these images right in front of patients and have them look at them with you at the same time. It's a, it's a really a, a fun and interactive thing and has made practice a lot richer for me. It's not just another year of doing the same thing. And I also can see a lot of limitations of a lot of the treatments that we've done in the past once you can see some things uh, in 3D also. You know, what's really interesting is we we did a procurement survey not too long ago, uh, about a month ago, uh, all, all sizes of group, uh, one to 10 practices and, and the large groups. And we had 12 questions. And one of the questions was when when buying a product, right, What what what's the most important? We can kind of rank it from one to whatever. Um, and, you know, a lot of people think, well, it's, group practices are all driven by costs, right? And, and cost is certainly important. But, you know, we looked at um, patient uh, satisfaction, clinician satisfaction, right, uh, as, as being uh, very high up there. Uh, we looked at the quality of the product as, as actually being number one. Um, training and education was was higher than the price. So price was like number four on the list. You know, it was still important. So, you know, we're kind of listening, going back to the conversation we had, you, we, you talked about the price coming down, right? So the cost has come down. Um, we've talked about really from a patient perspective, you know, the patients are interested, right? They, they are actually engaged with, with a 3D image more so than a 2D image. They understand it more. So they're engaged there. And, and so let's talk about the education and that training component, because that that's really key to, to getting dentists comfortable using this and maybe, you know, using it for treatment planning and diagnosis. So let's talk a little bit about the education. And Dr. Brandis, you talked about um, it was 3D every day, right? So let's right. talk a little bit about that. Sure. Uh, I've been involved in doing specific comb beam education for, for dentists uh, for over 10 years now. And uh, I've probably educated in small groups of uh, usually uh, 25, 30 doctors or less, uh, about a thousand dentists in combing. And the focus is really around a couple things. First, simple navigation. And that's, that's, uh, that has a lot to do with the software and learning how to navigate and, and function in it. Uh, that can be done pretty effectively in just about a day long course. And, uh, and to the point where they're ready to go out and, and really take on things. Uh, the learning curve, I, I consider a fairly fast one. Uh, the, the second part of that is really learning, and I sort of alluded to it, is to learning how to implement this into your practice. When are you going to use this and how are you going to use this and how does that fit in your practice flow? And everybody has a little bit different flow to doing exams and stuff, but but this is pretty easy to build in. Uh, it doesn't require a lot of additional time. It doesn't uh, It doesn't make an examination take a lot longer. As a matter of fact, you're already sort of starting to work on the case presentation part of it right while you're doing the exam. So um, it, it flows well. And, but I think that to really maximize uh, uh, the, the uh, return on investment and so forth, then, then you really have to learn how to utilize it. And that, those are short discussions. And I think people can still figure out how to customize and use the features of this, you know, based on their style and, and their decision-making pro pro progress and so forth, like, like Mark was talking about. So it has flexibility. It doesn't have to be done that way. And the other thing about the, the uh, training, I think, is, uh, or any product, too, is how easy is it for the staff to use? In other words, with Comb Beam is, do you have a product that, that the staff can use easily and obtain a good image to start out with before we even talk about what we're going to do with that image? And, and uh this uh, Air Techniques uh, certainly has that uh, with the uh, laser alignments and other things that make patient positioning good 
and it's easy to obtain a good scan. And you can upload that in about two minutes. Uh, a lot of the original stuff used to take uh, seven, eight minutes uh, to upload. So you know, had to do kind of song and dance where you're waiting for an image. You don't have to do that any longer. But but I think, yeah, there's two components. One's learning how to navigate. Um, and and the subcontext of that, too, at the same time, as of course, is learning um, how to evaluate those images from a clinical standpoint. We're very well versed in radiology, so you're just getting better looks at things that you've seen in the past. So that's pretty simple. And then uh, so learning how to navigate through volumes and, and understanding what's going on there. And then the second part is the implementation part. And then for the for the DSO format, then it really comes down to training the trainers. And, and we, we have a program for that, too. Uh, certainly, any individual doctor could seek out this education on their own. But uh, in, in a larger you know, groups so in, in, in that practice setting, then it would be training trainers to be able to, to do this uh, with uh, larger, larger groups and so forth. That's great. Um, so let's talk about, everybody loves to talk about new technology. So what, what, are, you have, what are you seeing out there when it comes to, to imaging? And um, I just love to kind of see where things are now compared to where you were you know, 12 years ago. You talked about just the upload speeds going from, you know, seven or eight minutes to two minutes. But t tell me about some new things that you're seeing and using. Sure. You know, the, 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 the nice thing about this technology is that all of these advances primarily have been software upgrades. So, for example, uh, it's, it's better computing power and so forth that makes us be able to upload an image a lot quicker. Uh, the quality of the images is, is, is getting better, um, but the quality has always been pretty good. Uh, we're, we figured out how to subtract out a lot of metal artifacts, for example. That was a mathematical algorithm. Uh, but the uh, hardware of, of, of comb beam is, is fairly simple. And, and really, the, the elegance of it is, is in software. The nice thing about it, even though my, my uh, scanner uh, is 12 years old, it has the same capabilities of all the scanners that are being sold today uh, for the most part because it's it's just upgrades in software. So uh, it hasn't become antiquated unlike so many other things that have cameras and other components. Uh, it's pretty bulletproof that way. But what we've seen technology-wise is, is what Mark was mentioning, and that is a lot more artificial intelligence is being added in. So for example, uh, with the Air Techniques Unit, it uh, has a thing called clear pan where it can optimize the and focus the panoramic image through artificial intelligence to make sure that all the relevant structures are included in the focal trough. So when the image loads up, it's it's in focus right off the bat when you present it to the patient. You don't have to spend time trying to optimize the panoramic curve. At the same time, it can uh, use um, IA or AI to, uh, to mark the nerve. Uh, so that right there, you have that right in front of you as a clinician without really having to touch anything. You're ready to just start into your into your examination and presentation at the same time. So uh, the same thing has progressed some on the implant side. There's lots more um, I, uh, AI coming into ideal implant placement and integration with CAD CAM at the same time. So these are all software up upgrades rather than hardware upgrades. And so um, it's made it so that, uh, you know, the, the original unit that I that I bought uh, hasn't become antiquated. There, There's not the uh, evolution like there has been in so many other products. So, so Mark, tell us a little bit. We really haven't ta touched much on air techniques and and the product itself, um, which is which is great. I appreciate it. We got a really great 101, you know, on on CBCT versus 2D, and also the how important education is, and and really how it's evolved in in the past um, 10, 15 years. T tell us about um, Air Techniques and and the Prime Unit that you have. Yeah, the Air Techniques. Provecta Prime 3D units is manufactured in Germany. And what we have done there is really focused on the software. As Dr. Brandis mentioned, we know that image quality 
has come to a point, much like digital cameras, I can't tell what's taken from a Canon, what's taken from a Nikon with a digital camera. It's really the software being used to process it. Um, the AI comes into play, which answers the education and the training question as well. Um, because the panoramic curve is optimized during reconstruction, so it, it's actually automatic once it shows up, it's already optimized. And the nerve inferior avular canals already mapped out uh, during reconstruction. That again, that's the first thing that's shown on the first screen, first picture. Uh, doctor doesn't have to take those extra steps, um, which means because a doctor doesn't have to take all those extra steps, they don't have to spend that much time training on it. So, um, Previously, I was spending four hours chairside with the doctor to show them how to map out, navigate, map out that inferior avular canal using the NPR views, the axial views and sagittal views to get it lined up so you could see everything. I counted how many clicks it took to map out a nerve without any mistakes um, and a minimum of 30 clicks just to map out the inferior avular canal on one side. Uh, so it, de it depends, again, on the software. So what does that mean? That means there's less training. It's really, let's see if the AI did its job so we could verify it. Uh, one doctor I spoke to recently, recently said uh, that she did not care for um, artificial intelligence. She rather say augmented intelligence because it's really assisting it's not replacing uh the clinician's intelligence which is accurate i i actually agree with that um so it's much faster for the doctor to sit down and bill if the doctor is just wanting to drop in a virtual implant dr brandis talks it talks about it as a virtual surgery if a doctor just wants to do that and see if an implant fits in a certain area with our system, it's as little as five clicks. And that means, according to clinicians, that saves them 15 to 20 minutes a patient because the software and the technology behind it has done a lot of the heavy lifting. So what does that mean? That means less time on the software. As much as I love the software and I think it's cool, I don't want clinicians spending time on the software. I want doctors doing dentistry, taking care of their patients. And I think that's where, we're, where we're, we win. And I think that's where we make a difference. Well, this has been a great conversation. Um, any, any final words from you, Dr. Brandis and Mark, and then we'll kind of wrap everything up. No, I think that the, the nice thing about the, these, uh, the software too, is it also interfaces with any kind of uh, other technology, whether that's uh, 3D printing, uh, whether that's uh, 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 CAD CAM uh, imaging and stuff. And so you want a system that the software can go across different platforms and, and this certainly can do that too. So um, to, to me, uh, it's very easy to be passionate about this subject because I, I think it's, uh, it's something that I engage with every day that I practice and uh, I, I can't imagine, you know, not having it. It's sort of once you have GPS, uh, you know, it's hard to imagine looking at a map. And uh, and does it help to know how to read a map? Yeah, uh, but but um, once you have more information, it's hard to go back to less information. It's a great point, Mark Alagan. Any final thoughts? I can't think of any. Uh... Thanks for asking good questions. The only thing I could add is, you know, technology has changed for the GP. Now they're, you know, you know GPs are uh, printing surgical guides in house now, right? They're, they're doing as much as they want in house or as little as they want. We have doctors that just want to measure or just look at an image for diagnostic purposes two doctors want to mill out or not mill out print out surgical guides now in-house for a low cost um, same day so it really depends on where the doctor wants to go and I think the best 
um, suggestion I have for anybody looking at CBCT is much like somebody who is shopping for a vehicle, right? Uh, shopping online for a car is great if you're looking for specifications, uh, maybe some features, other people's reviews, but nothing will replace a true test drive. Uh, I suggest getting your hands on the software and playing around with it. See if it's easy for you to use and something you will enjoy in your practice. If it's something that's going to cause you pain, don't buy it. Mark, if people want to test drive, how can they get in touch with you? They can email me at mark, M-A-R-K dot Elogan, I-L-A-G-A-N at airtechniques.com. Okay. Dr. Dr. Brannis, if anybody wants to reach out to you and has any questions. Uh, my uh, email is perio, P-E-R-I-O, associ, A-S-S-O-C. That's perio, asos at earthlink.net. And I'm happy to, uh, to uh, respond to anybody's questions. And uh, if need be, I'm happy to arrange a phone call too. If somebody has specific questions they want to follow up on. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Brandis. Mark Logan, thank you so much from Air Techniques. Uh, what we'll do is we'll drop those email addresses in the show notes as well, so you'll have access to those. Um, but uh, great conversation, learned a lot, a um, lot of fun, and um, it's it doesn't doesn't have to be scary anymore, right? And doesn't it's not just for implantology, uh, treatment, diagnosis, and treatment. Um, so we learned quite a bit. So thanks, gentlemen. Um, this is the Group Dentistry Now show, and I'm Bill Newman, so we'll see you all next time. The Group Dentistry Now show has listeners across North and South America, Europe, Asia, and Australia. If you like our show, subscribe today, and please tell your colleagues about us.